Jason from Bohemia Bees, and uh, we've got a pretty interesting uh, topic to talk about on today's video. That's uh, uh, probably for those hobbyist beekeepers. It's probably something that's that's new to them. Uh, if you're a sideliner uh, and you're involved with uh, any small scale pollination, uh, this this may be a good uh, refresher for you. And of course, if you're a commercial beekeeper, this is old hat. So uh, this is really just uh, how we have kind of stepped into. Uh, adding an additional revenue stream into our apiary. Uh, most people are familiar with selling honey, right? As a, as a means of trying to subsidizing your hobby, right? So you'll have a, a few hives, a few backyard hives. You make a, you know, a couple pounds of honey a year, maybe you know, a few hundred, and uh, you sell those locally at your markets or, or at your friends and family, and you can bring in a good revenue stream. Uh, there's also then making queens or, uh, or, or uh, you know, making nukes and, and selling bees essentially. That's another way that you can generate revenue in your apiary or for your apiary operations. Uh, additional to that, too, you have other things that, of course, naturally your beeswax and uh, other products of the hive, uh, propolis and things that you could also harvest, pop the pollen, of course. Uh, those are all great things uh, to bring in revenue for your uh, small operations if you're a hobbyist just to subsidize your hobby. As you progress into a sideliner, the expenses actually, as, as you know, can get a little bit uh, higher uh, because you're trying to either expand your operation to a full-scale business um, and you naturally have those expenses in equipment, uh, in bees, uh, you have bee losses that happen every year. Uh, so all those are variables that you have to think about when you're building a small beekeeping business. Uh, we'll, we'll plan to do a couple more videos on that specific topic, which is building a beekeeping business or a small beekeeping business uh, or making money from your bees. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, our viewers that have asked you know, how have you done it? How have you built out the things you've built out? I can tell you, it's not something that has made us a tremendous amount of money. It's taken a lot of expense, a lot of hours, a lot of time. Uh, and patience, though, will get us there. Uh, I know that uh, one day we will have ability to scale, uh, and I really look forward to that day. Uh, but for now, we just kind of take it uh, as as we um, as we progress, as the bees allow us to. Um, our operations have expanded very quickly in the last probably seven years. Uh, to from a few hives, backyard hobbyist hives, to uh, a full-scale sideline operation in which we are doing all those things that we just talked about, you know, from, you know, honey, uh, beeswax, uh, the products of the hive, pollen, uh, as well as the bees, the queens. Uh, and now we've uh, started to step into pollination or small-scale pollination. Uh, not at the commercial level where we're putting thousands of hives on large crops, uh, but more in our local region or local area, we've uh, contracted with a few farmers to do some pollination uh, to help their crop grow. So what is small scale pollination um, and uh, how do you get involved with it? Uh, I know that uh, a lot of people will, will ask, you know, hey, how do you do what you do? How do you get the contracts you get? How do you even set it up? Or are there any regulations or anything you need to worry about? Um, I won't get too much into the regulation side of it. There's not too hefty of a regulation unless you are sending your bees uh, through multiple states and or in uh, large commercial scale pollination or what I call uh, joining a larger outfit and, su and subsidizing. So Bruce's Bees recently, if you follow his channel, recently sent 50 or so hives to, uh, to California for the almond pollination. He jumped in with a larger uh, conglomerate of group and were, was able to send his bees in that manner uh, to, uh, to a California for that, that almond crop pollination. And it did wear very well for him. It helped his bees. He made a little bit of a profit margin on, uh, on the, uh, the return, uh, and I'm assuming he got some honey out of it as well. Um, not sure what he harvested from that, uh, but I know that that, that operation, that, that experience for him was, was, was not, I wouldn't say overwhelming, but it was a lot. Uh, it was first time doing it at that scale, uh, and it's with any beekeeper. Uh, and doing anything at any scale, it can be a little overwhelming. So, so I always recommend easing into it, uh, not just tighten a, a big bite at that apple. And, and as I always recommend, you know, having a mentor, right? Uh, you have mentors for hobbyist beekeepers, beekeepers that will, or other hobbyists that have been doing it for a lot, a long time that can offer up advice, give you tips. Uh, there's the YouTube channels that you can join and you can follow such as ours and others, the hundreds that are out there. Some of the uh, ones that we've mentioned in our prior videos, um, I'll give you a link in the description to below to one we did last year 
that was a conglomerate of several beekeepers that we followed on YouTube to help give tips on, on what they learned as a new beekeeper. But that's, that's beekeeping as a hobby. When you move into that sideliner role and you want to start to do sideline uh, pollination, uh, you need to find a pollinator, a sideline pollinator or a commercial pollinator, someone that you can, that's doing it already, that knows some of the pitfalls, some of the things that you need to kind of steer away from. Um, we've uh, partnered up and, and done a lot of work with uh, Delaware Bay Bees, um, Eric Thompson and his wife, uh, to learn about uh, pollination in general, that the, uh, the, you know, the practice of doing that, taking your bees out of your apiary and moving them to a location for a period of time and bringing them back. Um, so we've gotten a lot of good information and assistance from Eric uh, and his team over at Delaware Bay Bees. Um, I've also partnered also with a, another um, older commercial pollinator that's been in uh, the region that I live in, which is that Maryland, Delaware region, uh, Oliver Collins, um, who was extremely helpful, extremely insightful. He's been doing it for many years, even a lot longer than Eric and I, uh, and is just a wealth of knowledge. So being able to partner with those individuals and learning what they do um, and how they do it is just, just tremendous. It's tremendous uh, value. Uh, and then I can take that information, I can build on it. And then if I work with others that are getting into it eventually in the future, um, I can share that knowledge that they share with me. So it's always good to do that. So what is sideliner pollination as a service versus like commercial pollination as a service? I mentioned that, you know, the larger scale operations will move bees cross state, usually to uh, California for the almonds, uh, Jersey for the berries, uh, and various other locations across the U.S. that have uh, larger crops that need to be pollinated. Um, there's a lot of uh, honey that comes out of the Dakotas and in that north, uh, Midwest, north area of the United States. Uh, a lot of commercial beekeepers that will move bees uh, across the U.S. for those various crops to help try to uh, provide that as a service. Uh, we do it on a small scale. Uh, we are we are uh, grateful enough to have. Uh, a setup that's not your traditional pollination setup that you see, for example, with like Ian Stepler using the pallet method um, or using um, or others that are moving their bees that you see going into California. Uh, Jose uh, from California uh, is a broker of commercial beekeepers as well, was into that uh, that type of operation uh, for many years. And he understands the, 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 what you need to have to um, to be able to set up the operations like that and have it. Uh, I think the biggest difference between someone who's a a, um, a sideline beekeeper uh, versus a commercial beekeeper that does the pollination is really the uh, the frame of mind that they have about their bees, and and I wouldn't say that it you know in some context uh, it can be looked at in a negative manner, but I think it's all perspective, right? And and I, what I'll say is that um, a hobbyist looks at their bees as sort of a pet, uh, and I don't mean that in a negative sense. They want to take care of every bee and, and every bee is important. And, and not that a commercial beekeeper or a silenter doesn't think that way, um, but I think it's important to establish the frame of mind when you're keeping bees. Um, a, a hobbyist beekeeper will do things for their bees that a commercial beekeeper wouldn't even consider because the cost would be too expensive. Uh, a great example of that would be, for example, wrapping your hives during the wintertime to overwinter. Uh, a commercial beekeeper would never wrap their hives uh, in the winter that I'm aware of, only because uh, unless they're a, an operation that stays and, and winters their bees in, in a very cold climate. Uh, but even then, I don't believe that they'd take that, that, un, that to them, unnecessary step. They're going to move their bees to warmer climates around the country where they, they, they don't have to worry about buying that extra equipment to, um, to help those bees. Um, there's also a sense that it, that it, it also gives the bees a little more um, resiliency uh, by not, I wouldn't say coddling your bees, but in a sense, coddling your bees or taking um, extra precautions over precautions on, you know, trying to overwinter um, that colony of bees. Uh, I would say, though, the only thing uh, in that frame of mind is that that hobbyist is not doing anything wrong. They have a smaller amount of colonies, two, three, five, ten colonies. They don't want to lose any colonies. Uh, they can't afford to lose any colonies. You know, beekeeping is expensive, we always say. Uh, so they want to make sure that they are, uh, you know, getting every single colony as much as possible to overwinter where they're at since they're not moving them to a warmer client. So they're going to do those extra precautions where a commercial beekeeper would not. Sideline beekeeper is probably in the middle uh, in that they do sometimes over their winter or overwinter their bees in their apiary, um, much like we do. Uh, so we take a little bit of precaution, whether it be, you know, it's supplemental feeding, supplemental, um, you know, uh, the sugar shim we saw in previous videos, making sure that the wind block is in place making sure that our bees are strong and that they're, you know, low on mites. All those things that commercial beekeepers and hobbyists do alike uh, with the sideliner beekeepers, but they don't, um, 
uh, they do it to a different scale and we do it to a different scale. So as a sideliner uh, beekeeper, a few tips that I've learned uh, to help try to get you started is one, work on redundancy, right? Work on uh, volume of bees. Um, naturally that makes obvious sense, but it's a little harder to say that when someone who's got two or three colonies and, you know, they make a split, you know, now they got, you know, four colonies, right? Or, or whatever the case may be, or, or three colonies. Uh, that, that is sometimes harder than it sounds. Um, and it's, it sounds easy to just say, make a split, catch a swarm. Um, but it has to be done on scale. If you want to grow from, you know, two to three colonies to 20 colonies, like you see behind me, just to do one, uh, you know, set of pollination like we set up here, um, that takes a little time, right? It's, it's, it's a little bit of expense because you have to have the equipment to do it um, and have to have the, uh, the, the setup to do it. Um, so I would say focus on trying to build your volume of colonies. Um, don't try to focus on, are those colonies going to make honey this year? Are those colonies going to, you know, do this or that? Um, you want to focus on what their purpose is. Have a purpose. Have a purpose for those colonies. If they're honey uh, colonies, then then great. Make them, uh, put them, set them up that way. If they are bee making colonies, then set them up that way. Um, if they're queen making colonies, set them up that way. If they are pollination colonies, then set them up in a manner in which they're going to be successful with the pollination. Uh, and that can be just a couple little tweaks. It doesn't mean that there's a lot of difference with uh, how you would ma maintenance those colonies or, or treat those colonies. Um, it's just the the timing, the location, the equipment, everything is unique to what your purpose is for those for those colonies. So sideline beekeeping pollination could be done in many different ways. You could just take a, a few colonies, two or three, put them and set them manually in a location of a farmer that you may have worked with, maybe someone who has a local garden that wants to do some pollination. Um, I would say that the rule of thumb is that you want to have one to two colonies in a minimum to go on pollination or two colonies on a small garden, uh, an acre of land, two colonies uh, would be sufficient if you've got some general, uh, you know, vegetation crops, things like that, that you want to, you know, kind of help them pollinate. Um, I would say it's, it's a little harder to to make a, a significant amount of revenue from that. You may do it as a favor initially, um, but if you start to see that that farmer has some yield out of that or, the, or you come to an agreement initially that gives them a, a baseline, you can charge a price that makes sense uh, with the time that the frame of the bees are gonna be there. Um, again, commercial beekeepers, back to my earlier point, look at bees a little differently. Side, uh, pollination, uh, they look at it as livestock. Right? They're not going to uh, look at it as a pet. They're not going to look at it as a business, more like a sideliner would look at it as, but a commercial beekeeper would look at it as livestock. So this is livestock. These are 20 colonies, about a million bees that need to go on something to help the crop get pollinated effectively. Uh, pollination, as you know, is an important process in many fruits, nuts, and other and vegetables uh, in our uh, country, especially on large, large scale. Uh, you know, the pollination route is, is pretty intense uh, where they move thousands of bees around the country. And that livestock behind me is important to keep healthy, keep strong, keep fed, um, and continue to be able to go to the next crop to the next crop or what you choose to do. On small scale pollination, it's not necessary to uh, worry about um, them going from crop to crop because they probably won't. They probably will go to a singular uh, crop pollination, then come back and you have the time like we're going to do today, go through them, understand where they're at in their uh, they're sort of their uh, seasonal life cycle, uh, what needs to be done to help them uh, get through uh, the winter so that we can put them out in the spring for more pollination. Okay, so before I get into some bees here and check out this cart after uh, I just returned it from a recent pollination contract, uh, we had these on watermelons. So again, uh, not, the time frame is important as we talked about for when you're going to be putting your bees on crops. So, you know, I talked about you know, an acre of land and having one to two colonies is, is important to you know, use for that small scale pollination. When you start to move into a few acres, several acres of a particular crop, an example will be watermelons or cucumbers or, or something along those lines, tomatoes, various other types of uh, crops that you may go into on a sideline or apples, a small apple orchard uh, is a great one early in the spring. Uh, all of those crops uh, and the amount of that crops, uh, those crops uh, are important to know how many bees you put on them. And, you know, I, I've not mastered that piece of it yet to understand the volume per acre. Um, there's some recommendations uh, then I know that Eric from uh, Delaware Bay Bees has made um, based on the type of crop. And it's really about the duration as well. And the duration reflects what you charge, right? So if I'm going to put bees on something for less than four weeks, you know, I might charge one price. If I'm going to put them for more than six weeks, then I'm going to charge another price. And the purpose of that is that I'm taking my livestock into a, um, a pollination contract. And I want to make sure that um, I'm getting the value out of that contract for my time the bees, the potential losses that will come back because 
Uh, there are some factors that you have to consider when doing pollination, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, uh, some risks for doing pollination. Um, but uh, I would say that the, the size of the location, the type of crop is important to know. Uh, so you can structure your contractor agreement with the, uh, the actual um, you know, farmer that you're doing the contract with. Okay, so to wrap up this video for an, another short period, we're gonna talk about some of the tips that I learned recently about pollination or small scale pollination from my mentors that I'll share with you. Um, and then naturally we'll wrap it up with some of the risks. Uh, and then, uh, and hopefully that gives you enough to understand what we do for small scale pollination and maybe make it applicable for your apiary that you're growing. Some of the tips that I were, was given recently uh, that I'll share with you is one, you need to make sure you, you think about um, moving your bees uh, at night. You need to ensure that the timing of moving your bees, uh, bees are out foraging through the day as we know. So the, most of the time that beekeepers will move bees are at night. Um, you know, a couple tips are bees, uh, bees don't see, uh, see red light. So, you know, if you want to get some, some red headlights um, or something like that, you can see then what you're doing at night. The bees don't typically get agitated by that because of the red light. Um, you also want to make sure that you determine where you're going um, and the route you're going. If you're taking bees uh, and you're moving them on a trailer like you see behind me, this is a pollination trailer that was custom built by Oliver Collins many years ago. This is the style that he's used for many years. It's successful. You also see people who also put them on four-way pallets or pallets and then move them where they need to be. Uh, and then of course you have some other smaller scale uh, pollinators who will just move them manually one or two hives at a time on the back of a trailer or in a truck. Um, but it depends on what you're using to move them. You probably would close them up in most cases. The boxes you see behind me um, have these doors that were created. They're special boxes with cleats on the side. You see the, the they don't have the standard handles that you see on a traditional box. They have a cleat. Uh, and that cleat is actually used to lift that uh, box when heavy on or off the trailer uh, using a special type of um, a jack that, uh, that Oliver has also built too, or a, you know, a lift that he's built. It's like a, a bee box lift if you've ever seen those before. Um, I don't have a, I'll show a picture at the end of the video of what that looks like, uh, that bee lift. Um, but that's what those cleats are for, uh, as well as if you're going to do commercial pollination and you're putting them on and off pallets, the cleats may also be helpful, but the pallets really are the lifting mechanism. Um, so your boxes will need that. Uh, and then last, but, uh, you know, a few other thoughts when you're transporting bees, you got to think like, you know, in an, in a, um, a scenario where the, the risk could be, um, you know, could be apparent, could be, it could exist, right? You got to make sure that everything's strapped down and, and you have, it's been checked, you know, a couple times, make sure that the tires on your vehicle that you're transporting the bees are good and solid and that they're not leaking air or that they're rotted. Um, you need to have those types of things in place because remember, you're moving millions, thousands, if not millions of bees from one location to another. And that there are people around that are probably, you know, deathly allergic to bees in some cases. And what the last thing you want to have happen is be the headlines on some news story in your town uh, that you've, you know, crashed your uh, bee uh, transportation and bees are everywhere, right? You know, that we see those on television and, and naturally you feel for the bees, you feel for the beekeeper, you feel for what's happening there. Um, but it can be a tra traumatic event for people if that occurs near them or by them or if a car hits it. So, you know, Oliver always says to me, he said, you know, you need to make sure that you check all those elements when you're moving bees. Do it in a manner in which you're respectful for the motorist around, around you. Um, make sure you wear your bee suit when you're traveling, right? I know it sounds strange. You're hot inside the truck. You've been working on bees. You get in, leave the bee suit on. Um, just put the veil down. And the reason why is if you happen to get, God forbid, get in an accident, um, and you need to get out of the vehicle, you're not rooting around for your bee suit if you need to handle moving bees or you need to handle doing uh, something to take care of the situation that may have occurred. Um, bring a couple hive tools, you know, just in case you forget, you know, have your smoker, all your tools and stuff, make sure you double, triple check that you have those because you never know what you're gonna need where you're going. You're not in your apiary to go get an extra piece of equipment. You know, have a couple boxes extra in case you get there and realize that a couple boxes are damaged um, or if, God forbid, an accident happens again, that you need to have that extra equipment. Um, some of the risks of beekeeping uh, with in the pollination is putting bees on pollination um, is naturally you're moving bees. So you're stressing bees. You want to make sure that you uh, and you observe that you understand that and that you know that your bees are not going to um, maybe be as prolific from, you know, pollination contract to pollination contract. You want to make sure you're continuously expect, inspecting them, feeding the supplemental, feeding them if necessary, if you're not building honey stores to harvest, um, as we talk about. Um, and then naturally, the pests, right? So wherever they go, they may be exposed to certain other pests 
um, or even, uh, you know, pesticides or fungicides. Um, they're going to get uh, impacted a little bit stronger than they would in your own apiary um, because you you can control that to a point. Um, so keep that in mind. So you make sure their gut is healthy. Use uh, supplements to help their gut. Um, making sure you're inspecting them and you're, you're weeding out the weaker colonies when you get them as a break off pollination uh, and things like that. So, um, you know, in addition to that, just have fun with it, right? Um, this is another source of revenue for your apiary as we talk about. Um, it's, you know, it, it can bring in a significant amount of revenue the more hives you can put out, but ease into it. Don't get yourself overwhelmed um, and it could be a successful uh, piece of your, your apiary business. Um, I think, um, I think for me, this is my first year doing pollination crime tracks. We had uh, bees on strawberries. We had bees on watermelons. Uh, these just came back from watermelons. Um, watermelon crop does not produce a lot of nectar. It has good pollen, very good pollen, but not a lot of nectar. So I expect that these colonies may not have uh, good honey stores. Uh, they were all pretty strong in the, in the deep below it. Uh, and we added the empty honey supers on top just in case they found a, a nectar source there that was significant, they would fill them. So we're hopeful to get some honey off this, but we may not. Um, but we did get the pollination contract and we're excited about where the future holds for that. Um, so again, um, I hope you've learned something from this video. I know I just talked a lot. I'm gonna do a, a quick inspection on these and I'm, I'm gonna get into the these, these colonies behind me, see how they're doing. I've done a cursory inspection and all the colonies came back with live bees coming in and out the, uh, the front. Some are a little stronger than others, as you can see back there. Um, but the, the, for the most part, they all look strong, but we're going to dig into them and see what they look like. And hopefully uh, we got a, uh, a good set of strong bees back from this contract and it was a good successful operation. So I hope you learned something. I hope you took something away. Um, I appreciate the support on the channel. I know this is not a typical uh, hobby beekeeping video like I do, but it was just another piece of my business model that I wanted to share with everyone. And I know it was a lot of talking and sometimes I talk fast. So, um, you know, if you have any questions, hey, do me a favor, just hit the link below. Um, you know, definitely reach out to us. Um, you can email us at bohemiabees.com uh, or Bohemia Bee. You can go to bohemiabees.com, our website, our, our stores on there. You can email us at bohemiabees at gmail.com. Um, all those ways that you can get a hold of us. Um, happy to answer questions. We love just interacting with the community and other beekeepers. So I appreciate everything, uh, all the support. And uh, here at Bohemia Apiary, as you can see, Beekeeping has definitely become more than a hobby. It's an obsession. Thanks for watching, everyone.